It's kind of like greeting people in church. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Kind of. I don't do that a lot, though. Then you're a bad Christian. I know. <laughs> <laughs> And welcome to Plain Truth, a Holy Spirited podcast. This is Maggie Elmer, and I'm here with my partners in crime. Sky Kisker. And David Watson. And uh, we are here to talk about some interesting things today. David, what are we talking about? We are talking about revival in the church. Woo-hoo. Or we can also call it church renewal. Those aren't necessarily the same thing, but revival is a kind of church renewal. Yes. I'm for it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I we wish I, it. I I knew what it looked like. I've never seen revival before. You haven't? No. What do you when you say you've never seen revival? Uh, what do you what do you what do you envision revival is that you haven't seen? Hmm, that's a good question. Is it like the movie The Apostle? No, I don't think I've seen that movie. <laughs> All right. You should see it. It's, um, good. it's a good movie. I envision. I guess what I've read about, which is, you know, like they when they talk about the early Methodist camp meetings or, um, or I guess that sort of very charismatic sort of the Holy Spirit breaking out among the people and there being um, a deep, you know, sense of conviction or repentance and then, you know, worship and that is... Effusive, of yeah, the Holy yeah, Spirit the whole present. gifts of the Holy Spirit, and yeah. I've certainly seen people speak in tongues, and I've seen people be slain in the Spirit, but I've never seen it communally fall over a group of people who call themselves a church. That's what I think of when I think of revival. That kind of big, I don't know, just magnificent display of the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, uh, I've seen that happen before. I've seen it happen um, in the United States, and I've seen it happen in Cuba, and I've seen it happen recently in Brazil, uh, because I... Which is why you're tired this morning. Yeah, Yeah. uh, because I just got back from Brazil yesterday. David's been traveling for 36 hours? Yeah, something like that. You lose track, and after a while, it doesn't even matter (laughs) anymore how long it is. But you sort of forget where you are, and go into this nether world of traveler's haze. But uh, I just got back from a trip to Brazil with the healing evangelist Randy Clark. I was one of about 100 people on this trip, and it was quite something. And these are revivalistic gatherings uh, where people do come under the conviction of the Spirit, and there would be no shortage of people having the manifestations you mentioned of speaking in tongues or falling out or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it was quite powerful. We were at two churches. But, you know, so so that's a form of revival, and, and that kind of revival is also happening um, in Cuba. Mm-hmm. Um, under the, yeah, in several denominations, my work there has been with the Methodist Church in Cuba, uh, but Certainly those churches are growing, and they just have a very revivalistic spirit about them. Cuban Methodism is highly charismatic, and really it would look more like what we in the in North America think of as Pentecostalism. Hmm. So to, to us, that's what it would appear like. Wow. Which um, kind of makes sense since Pentecostalism comes out of, at least some forms of Pentecostalism come out of Methodism. Right, and, and there were Pentecostal or charismatic elements in early Methodism. Yes. As early as Wesley. Yeah. Well, Scott, talk about that. Well, um, I mean, Wesley believed that the Holy Spirit was uh, doing kind of just amazing things in his time and that he got to be a part of it. And, uh, I mean, there were times uh, certainly early on where, where the kind of manifestations of the Spirit that would happen during Wesleyan uh, preaching events were were what was drawing charges of enthusiasm uh, from opponents both in the more Calvinistic Methodist wing, Calvinistic Evangelical wing, and from the state church. So can I 
ask a question about what that means. What charges of enthusiasm? Why would that be bad? Oh, yeah. Well, if they don't use the term in the way that we use it today, which sort of means like, I'm rah rah, like, yeah, go God. Right. Uh, but they mean it by a sort of losing your reason completely. Huh. You're sort of, uh, you know, you you become. Uh, you go. It's a kind of form of madness, is how they would oh, have well, thought about it. Well, if that were it. a chargeable offense, we'd have a lot of problems in Methodism <laughs> today. <laughs> All right, <laughs> but not this kind of madness <laughs> where you're actually being worked on by the Holy Spirit. So people yeah. would. Um, Wesley actually, when he was preaching uh, for the doctrine of free grace, kind of against his sort of Calvinistic. Uh, uh, you know, the Calvinistic wing of the evangelical revival, uh, he would actually call on the Holy Spirit to manifest the truth of this doctrine, and then you'd have people start passing out. Wow. Yeah. So he, he to some degree, used, if that sounds like a, but, you know, said, look, the Holy Spirit is present. I'm preaching the truth. Let the Holy Spirit say if what I'm saying is true. Let yeah. the Holy Spirit demonstrate if what I'm saying is true. So, you know, he, he, that, that God's grace is available to all. That's basically what he was preaching on. Um, and, you know, there were, there was, like, this was a, a, a normal aspect of the Wesleyan Methodist movement, um, especially early on, but it continued into the, into the, you know, 17... 50s, uh, and it's in the 60s and 70s, 1760s and 70s, you have in a sort of another kind of eruption of these sorts of um, manifestations of the Holy Spirit. But by the turn of the century, like late 19th, early 20th century, then groups that are manifesting these are feeling a certain discomfort within Methodism, and you see groups splitting off of Methodism, and especially... Um, holiness groups. This right. is why you have, you know, these different holiness groups forming because Methodism is not, uh, especially within its hierarchical structure, not particularly friendly to um, expressions of charismatic renewal or holiness renewal. So what do you mean when you say that? What, um, what do I mean when I say what? What do you mean when you say that the the hierarchical structure of Methodism is not friendly to charismatic expressions of? Um, right. Well, I was talking about, you know, in the early 20th century, but I, th I think that's still the case today in okay. Methodism. Um, you did have the Aldersgate Renewal Movement formed out of, I think it was the General Board of Discipleship in the 1970s. Well, the General Board of Discipleship gave approval to it. Oh, okay. I mean, it, it, it forms out of the charismatic revival in the 70s and within mainline denominations. And then the denom uh, United Methodist said it's of God, and the Board of Discipleship kind of took it under its wing as, as a legit right. thing. Right, but now it's completely separate. E yeah, I guess. I don't, know, I don't know the details of that. But, you know, in the early... I was reading uh, James Heidinger's book called The Rise of Theological Liberalism and the Decline of American Methodism, and he talks about um, he talks about how the higher ups in Methodism um, tended to be strongly influenced by German theology and philosophy, mm. which was much more <clears throat> naturalistic, right. um, much more uh, giving much less space to kind of the direct divine intervention of God and the power and work of the Holy Spirit in this life for the manifestation of miracles and for salvations and these kinds of things. And so because uh, there was this disconnect between sort of the higher-ups and the people in the church, um, uh, different groups began to form, people began to feel unappreciated by the denomination, and they began to... Um, leave. Yeah, but the, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a gradual. You know, there's a, a period where kind of revival um, culture, where when it kind of expects that the Holy Spirit is is going to show up and do stuff, is defines Methodism, and 
uh, Russ Ritchie has a, a, a talk about the way camp meeting functions as to allow Methodism to continue to be, to contain this, uh, this to have this culture generally, while at the same time, you know, building its institution, its sort of internal institutions uh, as a church in this country. But even as late as the 1870s, many of the bishops who are elected at that time are are often holiness, uh, and at this time, holiness kind of means this. Uh, it's before the holiness Pentecostal split. You know, holiness advocates. Um, it, right. It. Once, and it's uh, interestingly, I mean, for, I say this as somebody who works for a seminary, uh, it, it's in that the same time that we start establishing seminaries, and when you start establishing seminaries, you um, need people to teach in them, and the way, and if we don't have PhDs being granted here, you send them to Germany to get their PhDs, which they then come back, ah. populate the seminaries, and the access to ordination then becomes this institutional route rather than what it had been, a kind of charismatic route to ordination where one looked, you know, does this person have fruits? Do they have the gifts? I mean, do they have faith? Do they uh, have Bear the fruit, gifts? Yeah. And is their work bearing fruit? So you think about, you know, somebody like Francis Asbury, the route to his leadership was not get your bachelor's degree, go on and get your bachelor of divinity, and then kind of mount the the hierarchy of the church, right. you know, ladder. So how does this translate to the local church? I mean, you've just sort of in in a way described how how at least in my mind the connection is how the culture of almost non-revival began to spread through this increasing sort of burden of you or I don't know if it's a burden, it might be a poor choice of words, but the process of first you have to do this, then you have to get this degree, then you have to meet this requirement, then you have to, as opposed to a spiritual evaluation of your identity in Christ or mm -hmm. however you want to say it. The things you're talking about, the culture of charismatic expression is not something I have witnessed in the local church. And I'm, I, I think I've met a lot of faithful people and there have been a lot of pretty phenomenal outbreakings of the Holy Spirit among individuals. But well, I, th I think it, it, it depends on what we mean by a charismatic culture, because I think people misunderstand that a lot. Yeah. And, you know, there are very, very, very emotive and expressive forms of charismatic Christianity. I mean, um, sometimes this, uh, you see this in kind of some of Randy Clark's um, stuff that you go to Voice of the Apostles or Voice of the Prophets, and and uh, a, lo a lot of the people there are very emotive in their expression of the work of the Holy Spirit. You go to something like Aldersgate, it's a little more dialed back in that regard. Right. But all charismatic means is that we think God gives us gifts for building up the church. Yeah. And we expect that the Holy Spirit is going to show up in worship active as an active participant. Yeah. So okay. now I, you yeah, say, you say you're saying. that, you know, and I, I happen to know because you and I uh, occasionally attended a, an evening church in D.C. that yes. was Anglican. Absolutely. I would say that, you know, there was an expectation uh, at oh, St. Yeah. Brendan's that you're here, the Holy Spirit is also here, and... He's probably going to do something. I agree. I it totally may not be. Agree. It may not be like slaying twenty-seven people in the spirit. But if you, you know, you want to come forward for prayer, you can experience healing. You can experience internal healing. You can experience. Uh, my wife was a member of uh, All Angels Episcopal Church in the like nineties when we were courting. I mean, that was a similar kind of environment. I mean, it, oh, I yeah. I don't mean to give. I don't. I'm not. I guess I'm not speaking of Christianity broadly. I guess I'm thinking very specifically about my own experience in Methodism, which I fully acknowledge is narrow. Mm. Um, because, yeah, I would completely agree with that. That was also my experience of being at St. Brendan's is that it was. Uh, and, I, and I also understand that there can be this sort of um, – misconception that charismatic worship automatically means something very emotive, which personally I'm, I'm often taken aback by because I'm not necessarily an, an effusive and emotional person. I am. 
I'm, <laughs> that's what people say about me, is that I am effusive. When and they're emotive. lying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I appreciate that distinction. Well, I think the important thing, you know, when, when I talk to Randy Clark about this, I've heard him say many times that in our churches, we need to cultivate an atmosphere of expectation. Yeah. It doesn't have to look the same in every context, but we need to cultivate an atmosphere where we believe that when we ask God to show up, God is going to show up. When we pray for people that our prayers have power, um, it doesn't mean that everyone we pray for is going to get healed. It doesn't mean that God's going to do everything we want, but that God does hear our prayers and that God does act in very meaningful and direct ways in our lives. And that expectation is nothing other than faith. Mm. It's the assurance of what we hope for and evidence of what we do not see. It's just saying, look, we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that the age to come, the resurrection age, is actually present now for us to enter into. So what are the things that prohibit that? I mean, what do you say to a, a church that says, well, I have faith and I believe what Scripture says is true and I do have an expectation, and yet, you know, what we're missing is fruit. I I want to I want to I want to sort of maybe push back on that that the, the question a little bit and say I have faith and I have expectation and God just doesn't show up and part of me just wants to say really you, you know you you go to church or you are participating in in a meeting and you you're legitimately expecting that the living Christ, who is right now alive, is there and doing stuff, but you might not see it or experience it in any way. And I, I kind of want to say, well, then, do you really expect it? I, I don't know. No, Maybe I agree. Harsh, no, no. Um, I, th I think that that's it. I, I guess I don't want to seem overly critical of the church because I love the church, and I think sometimes— loving the church sometimes also means having a lot of frustration with it. Yeah. But I... Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, but some t I often... I think that people give lip service to the idea of expectation, but that what their behavior and decisions say is something else. Yeah, right. And so I guess the question I'm asking is... is Right. Well, we... we, 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 we we often claim to have faith, but we walk by sight. Right. We exactly. don't really walk by. And I'm saying this about myself too, of course. I mean, and most Everybody of us. Everybody should are, say it right, about themselves. Course. Most of us are, you know, <laughs> most of the time, our default is operating out of the flesh. Right. I assume that nothing is going to happen unless I do it. Right. Or unless we, as a an institution, make it happen with the tangible earthly means at our disposal. And that's the institutional default, right? right. That, that's that the, if we can just get the right program in place, right. if we can just get the right worship team in place, if we could just get the right young leaders in here, then we can... I, I don't even hear people in United Methodism talking about reversing our decline. We can slow our decline. And I, I just... I'm so dissatisfied with this idea that we're just going to continue to decline. I reject that idea. I think that it's not God's will that fewer people come to Christ. I think it is God's will that more people come to Christ. And so the thing that what we've got to do is we've got to get on board with what God's already doing. People are coming to Christ all over the world. We're in one of the greatest times of missionary expansion in Christian history. And, and yet here in North America, especially in mainline Protestantism, we're not seeing it. And why is that? I, I mean, I think we've been sold a bill of goods that um, partly from the culture that we, we should, that the good thing to do is not to share your faith. Right, right because it's a privatization. Acceptable it's, thing. it's private and, you know, you're enacting violence on another person's culture or something by telling them about right. Jesus. And Well, we are so secular. I yeah. mean, we're a secular society for sure. There is an absolute separation from religion and the day-to-day -day living of life. Yeah. And if the Holy Spirit does show up, the immediate thing is that that's those people. There's something, you know. Weird. But I, I think we've lost we have lost the the identity um, as a 
Methodism today just isn't, it doesn't mean what it meant. <clears throat> when you think of Methodism today, you kind of think of, um, you know, it's kind of Eisenhower era uh, generic Christian Protestantism for mm -hmm. Americans, mm -hmm. right? And that is not what turned this into from a few thousand people to the largest denomination in America by the middle of the 19th century, you know. Um, then we got enamored of our own power and our own institutions and started relying on them. And surprise, when we stopped relying on the Holy Spirit for what we needed, we stopped trusting God for manna and trusting ourselves. We also stopped growing uh, at the rate of the population. So on this note, I think it, I want to recommend Frank Billman's book, yeah. which is called The Supernatural Thread in, in Methodism. Methodism. Yeah. That's a good book. It is. Frank is um, affiliated or has been affiliated for a long time with Aldersgate Renewal Ministries, and uh, he also is a, a mentor in our Doctor of Ministry program. When we started talking about Wait, church— Wait, before, before you leave that, I want to read—I just want to—I have something here that I found that I want to read to you. It's from Wesley's journal. Okay. May 28, 1759. Um, and he's actually— um, uh, printing a, 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 another person's account of what happened at, at a particular meeting. But um, he says, the text was having the form of godliness but denying the power of it. And when the power of religion came to be spoken of, the presence of God filled the place. And while poor sinners felt the sentence of death in their souls, what sounds of distress did I hear? The greatest number of them that cried out were men, but some women and several children felt the power of the same almighty spirit and seemed just sinking into hell. This occasioned a mixture of various sounds, some shrieking, some roaring aloud. The most general was a loud breathing, like that of persons half strangled and gasping for life. And indeed, most of the cries were like those of dying creatures. Great numbers wept without any noise. Others fell down as dead, some sinking in silence, some with extreme pain and violent agitation. I stood on the pew seat, as did a young man in the opposite pew, an able-bodied, healthy countryman. But in a moment, while he seemed to think of nothing less, down he dropped with a violence inconceivable, and the beating of his feet were ready to break the boards as he lay in strong convulsions at the bottom of the pew. So that sounds like what I just saw in Brazil on this trip with Randy Clark. In fact, the first time I went to one of these meetings with Global Awakening, I thought to myself, wow, these people are like early Methodists. I mean, they really believe in conversion, they believe in evangelism, and they believe in, in the converting power of the Holy Spirit when the Spirit falls upon not just one pe person, but a group of people. And it also sounds like what I've seen in Methodism in Cuba, um, where, and I, I've not been involved in African Methodism, but this is what I also have heard is happening there, that there is a powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and yet we in the U.S. are... I think we're afraid of that. Yeah. Actually. Oh yeah. Are are we afraid of that so much or are we afraid of being disappointed by God? I think it could be both. There's things. a boldness among Christians in these in these other areas where you see revival breaking out where you know what? If I see somebody in Kroger who needs uh, healing, I'll pray for them right there. Right. And expect that God's whole, the Holy Spirit could do that. Yes. There's all so I I think it's it's that. Um, there's also a desire for respectability oh, yeah. that's still very strong in Methodism and, and also now in large sections of evangelicalism that we've just got to let go of. I mean, the, the world is not going to like us. Jesus was pretty clear about that. Or respect that. us. Or respect no. us. They and think we're pretty foolish. <laughs> And, and so, and that's why, you know, the whole beginning of 1 Corinthians is really about that very issue, uh, the foolishness of the cross. God chose what is, is foolish in the world to shame the wise, what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And so when he's, he's writing uh, to the church in Corinth in um, 1 Corinthians 2, 4, he says, my speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and power. 
And that's the only thing, I think, that is going to bring the next generations to Christ. It's not going to be plausible words of wisdom. We've tried plausible words of wisdom. I mean, yes, good preaching can bring people under conviction, but even that is a demonstration of the Spirit oh, and yeah. power. So without that demonstration of the Spirit, I think we're not even in the game. So before we started the podcast, David, you said you wanted to talk a little bit about spiritual warfare, and I know we're running out of time, but what was it that you wanted to say or, or talk about with related to spiritual warfare? Yeah, that's a pretty loaded term, um, but and, and it, I think that for a lot of Methodist folks, mainline Protestant folks, it embarrasses them. Mm. But in our baptismal vows— in United Methodism, we still ask people, do you reject or do you denounce the spiritual forces of wickedness? Now, that gets left out a lot in a lot of churches. I, I hear it less often than I hear it. But nevertheless, that's in our liturgy. What do we mean when we say that? What are the spiritual forces of wickedness that we're talking about? And it's very clear throughout the New Testament that um, these, this notion of the spiritual forces of wickedness, that wickedness isn't just something that people do. Wickedness has a spiritual component, and we can't save ourselves from it. Only God can save us from these spiritual forces of wickedness. We're not strong enough on our own. We're not smart enough or holiness, holy enough on our own. And so the atoning work of Jesus Christ and the infilling of the Holy Spirit are absolutely essential if we're going to overcome these spiritual forces of wickedness in our lives. Yeah, and I, I don't know if it's, you know, I, I worry that, uh, that too many mainline Protestants have sort of bought the lie that we can save ourselves. Oh, yes. That because we are... Uh, privileged, mostly middle class people who have an, a modicum of power and respectability in the society that if we just get our act together, we will make the things happen. We will make the kingdom of God. We will build the kingdom of God on right. earth. And that was sort of the mantra of mainline Protestantism, and it still is in a lot of places. Even in our mission statement, we're going to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Well, yeah, I, I do believe that b the world will be different because of Christian people. You know, people are going to receive food who didn't receive food, and, and they're going to be um, all kinds of good things happen, but it's not like we're going to usher in the kingdom in its fullness because of our efforts. Right. That's impossible, and it underestimates the, the depth of sin in human life. And, and the thing is, be, you know, with the resurrection of Jesus, the kingdom is now is present, and one should expect evidence of the kingdom's presence now. Right. Right? And, and that we because we 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 don't want to be we don't want to be put to shame in the sense of you know truly believing in the unseen which i mean you know and and allowing the evidence of the unseen to be a part of our common life um and you know we'd much rather be uh viewed as you know equal partners with uh, with the world, you know, in trying to, you know, work for good. Right. Yeah. And that's just not, if, if, if scripture is true, and I make the assumption that it is, that's not the picture of the way the world is. Right. So we're operating under a false, you know, paradigm of how wickedness is defeated, and thus we are surrendering to wickedness. So what is something different that a faithful person can do to either develop awareness in themselves or 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 grow in in their uh, the depth of their relationship with Christ or I I mean I know do is such a tricky word because we can't make it it's not it's not something that you do on your own right 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 what I always tell people is Find a community of believers who share your expectation and the power of God. 
Now, um, if you're someone who wants to bring renewal in, in your own church, and your church isn't experiencing that right now, that's fine. I mean, I'm not telling everyone to go switch churches or something like that. What I'm saying is find believers yeah. that you can be in fellowship with who share your expectation of the power and work of the Holy Spirit, who actually expect that God is going to do something when they pray. And I, I think that's extremely important for the cultivation of faith. We don't do this on our own. We do it in community with other people. Yeah. And, I mean, if, if you go on the Aldersgate website, you can also see where, you know, other United Methodists are, uh, you know, maybe, you know, training people in discernment or training people to listen to the Holy Spirit or uh, even healing and, and, you know, go to their conference, or, you know, f- f- become part of that com- larger community of renewal within United Methodism. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think I often wish that... Um, everybody could meet someone in the body of Christ to help them see the gifts that God gave them, the spiritual gifts that God gave them. I benefited from having people like that in my life. And I often think that, um, you know, people walk around not understanding that they are deeply gifted by God to be his agents in the world. And build up the body of Christ. Yes. I mean, think, you know, I, I think about people who have prayed over me for, you know, internal, you know, psychological healing or, or even for discernment about uh, moves. And these things sound un, you know, well, they, they're pretty, they're major to me, you know, but uh, the, that is, has been the work of the Holy Spirit mediated mm-hmm. through the church, yeah. which is the church. The, the, the work of Christ is always mediated through the community and uh, because that's what God decided God wanted to do. <laughs> and so if you're in a community where there's not a sense, any sense of expectation of God, where it feels like um, my, my Pentecostal friends would say that, that there's a spirit of, that there's a religious spirit. Oh, yes. And, and, you know, what they mean by that is what Wesley called having the form of religion without the power. Mm-hmm. And if you're in a community like that and you want to try to bring renewal, you need to find some other place to get your battery charged. I mean, you need to find some other place um, alongside your church community to be in dialogue and communion and prayer with like-minded believers. And I do want to say, you know, when Wesley says the form of religion without the power— doesn't mean that the form is bad. Right. That's right. We yeah, need yeah, form. Yeah. It just has to be both. Yeah, you ha- you have to have both because you know, sort of just the quote power of religion ends up in enthusiasm. Wesley said, "What enthusiasm is? This was his argument: is folks who want the ends without the means. They want the experience of the Holy Spirit, but they don't want the means of grace. They don't want a disciplined life. They don't want mm. to be." you know, part Sanctified. of a worshiping community. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so they're kind of, you know, ru- running after, you know, the next... Uh, high. Yeah. They want the high. Spiritual high. Right. Yeah, right. So one time I heard Larry Randolph speaking, um, and he, he said something very surprising because he's a revivalist, a renewalist, and, and he said he was praying against revival right now. And I was, I think everyone was kind of shocked to hear that. But he said um, the reason is because too often he sees that we want the power of God without the character of God. We want all the fireworks, but we don't want to be transformed. But but really, the gifts of the Spirit, we have to remember, are for the building up of the church, and the purpose of the church is to create saints, to lead people into salvation. And that takes on a particular form of community. Right. You know. So it's hard work, but yeah. it's good work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today. And um, thank you for joining us. You can get in touch with David on his Twitter account at UTS Doc. And um, you could write a letter to uh, United Theological Seminary for Scott. You really could. I, I also do have an email. Address. Oh, you do have an email address? <laughs> yes. Would you like to give it out to the uh, wide world? No, no, not really. No. So if <laughs> but you if you go on the United website and you do want to talk, you know, I I am open. Uh, you know, you'll you'll find me. Yeah, <laughs> I I recommend. I encourage actually the contact because you know my 
my own husband, who is a United Methodist pastor, has written to other pastors and writers and teachers who he has been influenced by and uh, inspired by. And when they have responded, it has been a powerful thing. All right. So it's stkisker, K-I-S-K-E-R, at united.edu. Do you see what I just did there? St. Kisker. Yes. <laughs> you're, oh, you're, I, I St. Kisker. I got, I got that is, uh, that's an ender. Right that's there. a good one. All right. We'll see you guys next time. More. Bye. See you later.